Good morning, church. Right. It's that time of year again. Passion Week, right? We got Easter coming, Palm Sunday's coming, it's St. Patrick's Day. Crazy things are happening. People are winning championships, and I mean, right? It's crazy. But you know what it also means? It means the pollen is coming, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, hey, James, can we, can we do something to make that look a little more like North Carolina, a little more fish? There we go. That's what I'm talking about. Mm. It's that time of year. And uh, I'll tell you what, if, uh, if pollen don't get you, the worship in Potter's hand will. And I am so grateful for, that's the highlight of my week, guys. I just love it. <clears throat> Sometimes I dread having to preach after that. You know what I mean? So I'm sorry if I'm slinging snot all over the place up here, guys, but God does have a great word for us today, and it is about passion. And I am so, so fired up. This is, this is going to be a great next two weeks as we lead up to the Holy Day, and it wouldn't surprise me if we sing that song again that we opened with, talking about all that Jesus went through, and how you can hear that and not have passion, or at least understand that he is passionate about you, his love, the depth of his love, what he went through awesome. So powerful. And it got me thinking, what am I passionate about? What are we passionate about, right? What are you passionate about? If somebody were to come up and ask you that, what would you say? Maybe I should ask your kids <laughs> or your spouse, right? They could tell you. You know, I know my kids, oh, he's passionate about Striper, Star Wars, and Saban, the three S's, right? <laughs> I lost one of them. He's not even coaching next year. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I hope that they would say I'm passionate about my Savior. I really do. I hope. But some days, I don't know. You know? Passion is a funny thing. Isn't it wild that we can be passionate about anything in America except God? <laughs> right? That's not cool. We, 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 don't, we don't need to be passionate about anything. Uh, you know, don't get crazy on us. Don't get religious now. That religious spirit, see? We can be passionate about football, basketball, we can be passionate about movies and fashion and food, and some of us are real passionate about food, and, you know, all those, and that's great, but oh, don't you get passionate about your faith now. That's, that's a little weird. People look at your side eye, you know what I'm saying? They give you the, the judging look, like, oh, he's a weirdo. He's one of those people who's just passionate about Jesus. Man, I hope my passion never goes out. You know, I, I look at last night, you know, it was, it was awesome. We were watching. And no, no matter what team you pull for, we get crazy. People make these signs. and they're Just like, it is amazing. People will stay up all night long making these signs, sometimes coming between you and your spouse. Like, I mean, the, the friction. And, and we get passionate about so many things. And, and they will think nothing of a grown man weeping if your team loses, Right? And they'll think nothing about a grown man going up to a complete stranger and chest bumping them in the middle of a game. No one will think, they'll think, oh, that's a fan. But if you do that about Jesus, oh, that's a fanatic. Isn't that interesting? Why is it in our culture? I mean, passion is awesome. We need that. Passion is the motivating engine behind everything great. Art, literature, film. I mean, you think about it. architecture. Music, every great thing. Nothing is accomplished without passion that's fantastic. Now, maybe I should say nothing great is ever sustained without passion. You know what I'm talking about? Passion is that energy that says, you know, I'm going to get out of bed. I'm going to do something worthwhile today. And without passion, our life becomes boring and mundane and routine and sleepy. And we just get lethargic, you know. But God gave you emotions to have passion in your life. Passion is what motivates us. It mobilizes armies into action. It's what gives scientists that desire to stay up all night, just slaving over the microscope, looking for cures to that dreaded disease. Passion is the thing that makes good athletes stretch themselves and push to go from good to great to break world records. Passion is what allows explorers to boldly go where no one has gone before, where you can do great things. So, so, I know some of you understand. There is so much wrong with that right there. Your eye is twitching. And if you don't understand some of this, that's okay. There's a lot of culture packed in that one slide right now. A lot of wrong culture. So as we approach Palm Sunday and Easter, let me ask you this opening question. What would you say you are really passionate about? There's no wrong answer. 
But I will tell you this, there's definitely a right answer. There's definitely something. Colossians 3.23 puts it like this. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Not as if you're doing it for men, right? But work at it as for the Lord. He says, I want you to do everything passionately, especially when it comes to loving me, serving me, and living for me. So let me just stop and give you the challenge right here. We'll go home. <laughs> How are you doing with that? <laughs> I got your hopes up. Did I look serious, Clark? No, we're not going home quite yet. <laughs> let me ask you this. We're three months into the new year, roughly. Do a little self-inventory this morning. All right, just be totally honest. It's Potter's hand. You're safe here. And you don't have to answer out loud. How would you say you are doing so far in 2024 with loving God with passion? How would you say so far you are doing this new year, these first, say, 75 days, with loving and serving God with passion? A little different. How about loving, serving, and living for him with passion? See, Passion Week starts next Sunday with Palm Sunday. And I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of good friends here, and a lot of people are weary and they're tired. And in a moment of candor, they may even say, Pastor, I don't really have a lot of passion. <laughs> don't really have a lot of anything. Not a lot of zest, not a lot of zip, not a lot of zazz. I don't know if that's a word. And if that's you, I want you to know you are normal. It's okay. You live in a fallen, broken, hurting world. And it will take its toll on you. And it will do everything it can to suck the passion out of you. That is normal. That's why I'm so excited with what Paul has for us today. In Romans chapter 12, he says this. Look with me. He says, your love must be sincere. I want you to hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. There's that word again. Honor one another above yourselves. We've been talking about this for personal revival, right? Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Did you notice it didn't say serving yourself? That's our default, right? It's easy to wake up, what's on, what's on my agenda today? No, no, God, what's on your agenda today? That's what I want to ask when my feet hit the ground. In fact, let's zoom in on that last verse. I really want to look at, he says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Like, you want to circle that. If you write in your Bible, circle the word keep, because there's something there that I've missed before. This is a hidden gem right there, hiding in plain sight, that honestly I have missed over the years. That word keep is used on purpose for a reason. You know why? Because it's telling me it is not something that happens automatically. Did you catch that? Just because I accepted the Lord, I had the Holy Spirit living inside me, it doesn't mean that the rest of my life I am going around with all kinds of energy. And I, you have some, and you have, and just throw it like pixie dust. Paul is saying, guys, you need to work at this to keep your fan flaming, that those, those flames, right? Just like we talked about in that third song. Fan that flame, those embers that grow cold. Will you, will you blow that spirit wind? Did you catch what he's saying? He's saying this is not automatic. It is a choice. Better yet, it is a discipline. Keeping your spiritual fervor is not automatic. So the first thing I think we need to understand about where we are today is we are not, by nature, passionate about God. Did you catch that? We're not by nature. It's not our default setting. It's something Paul says we must choose to keep. This is why we get so easily distracted by anything and everything. I think everything conspires against us in the morning, right? To keep us from being passionate about our Savior. So Paul says, guys, I get it. I want you to keep your passion going. Keep those fires going. It is a discipline. It is not a default setting. It is not automatic. And before we go any farther, let me dispel a myth because I hear some people say, well, I'm just getting older. Or, you know, I'm just, I, you know, I'm tired. I've done my thing. And, and you know, this has nothing to do with age or personality type or being an introvert. Those who, who know me well know that when I step out of this pulpit, I am an introvert. I don't like being in crowds. It's weird. <laughs> just, just this week, true story. I bought a ticket. It's not in my notes. This is a bonus. <clears throat> I bought a ticket, I did a little gizmo, a little appy thing, I'm getting all high tech. Buy my seat, I pick a row by myself, not a single person on the row, okay? 
I'm in the car, driving by myself, my day off, I'm, like, I'm going to go, this is going to be good, I think I'm going to see Dune. And I'm going, I'm going to see what this is about. Okay. I call Amy and I say, I'm coming home. I said, what? What are you, what's wrong? I said, some yokel bought a ticket right next to me in this theater. Whole theater himself, he's got a ticket right next to me. So I hit refund, I got I turned around, came home, right? I don't, I don't want to be around, like, I'm an introvert unless I'm in the pulpit. Some of you are getting, you're right there with me, right? Am I weird? Maybe, okay, thanks. Some of you nod, thanks, that's great. Right? It's not about personality type. We know, and so do you, several senior citizens who have passion for the Lord. We know several older people in the senior adult range who are on fire, who have served the Lord for decades and decades and decades. Some are overseas right now serving in Ghana. We all know, and they're an inspiration, okay? So don't buy into the lie, I'm just getting older, my passion, I'm just getting, no, no, this has nothing to deal with that. The reality is we're living in a fallen, broken, hurting world, and everything, including your spiritual enemy, is working and conspiring to keep you from being passionate. He wants to dissipate your energy. Do you understand that? We, we had our 21st anniversary a couple weeks ago, right? Awesome. Great time. Great food. We had all these balloons in here. I remember about, oh, 10 years ago maybe, or our 11th anniversary, Amy and I went to Party City, and we got all these helium balloons, and we were so excited. They were the rubber ones, though, not the Mylar ones. And we had these things blown up Saturday, and it was awesome. And we filled them up. And they were so big and, and beautiful. And they, we had them on the stands and on the trees. And they were so high and exalted. We had them in the lobby. Saturday night, we left this place looking awesome. And then we came in Sunday morning. And they had all fallen during the night. It was like... Right? What happened? The helium had dissipated during the night. It also got cold. <laughs> and I came in, and it was the ultimate. Wah, wah, wah. I was like, all right, who's excited? Happy anniversary, everybody. Well, who died? <laughs> what is happening? This looked like a funeral parlor. All the, all the like, ribbons were tied to the thing, and the, they were going downward. Like we had just turned the roof upside down. It was, <laughs> it was pathetic, right? It was kind of embarrassing. And I looked at it and I said, you know what, this kind of makes me feel better that I didn't get the ladder out that night, because we had lost one in the lobby. It was 15 feet up in the air, and I thought, how in the world am I ever going to get that balloon down? And little did I know, just 12 short hours later, it would have taken care of itself, because they all fell. Doesn't the same thing happen with us? We get saved, we get excited, we get fired up. Man, we start getting jacked up. We go with small groups. We're, getting, we're, we're hanging out with people, and we got all this energy. It's getting big, isn't it, man? And I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, right? And like, we, we realize, man, my sins are forgiven. I got a new purpose in life. I have passion. I, I'm singing zippity-doo-dah. It is awesome. It's going. And then before long, if I'm not careful, I noticed I started losing steam. Started having that zip and that zest just, just a little bit go out. And without meaning to. <laughs> right? It's a gift for you, Lee. No charge. Take that home. Think about that. What happened? You know what happened? There's actually several things that happened. You've heard them. There's been books written about them. Some people call them passion killers. Some call them joy robbers. Whatever you choose to label them, there are things that will take the zeal and the joy out of your life if we are not vigilant, if we are not keeping the intensity, the fires, if we're not surrounding ourselves with people who bring us up. This is how you have constant passion for the Lord, okay? The first thing, probably the most obvious overlooked passion killer, is an unbalanced schedule. We have our priorities out of whack. If you've ever driven your car and you have one tire that's out of balance, <laughs> you know it. And if you don't do something about that tire soon, it is going to chew it up. It's going to have the edges are going to be missing and stuff. You're going to have silver bands showing. By the way, that's not a good thing. I thought, hey, my tire has silver in it. No, no, it's about to blow, sir. It's a bad thing. That's bad. 
You have to do something about it. See, my tires were out of balance. Pastor Rick Warren once actually called this the number one passion killer of the church today. An out of whack schedule, an unbalanced lifestyle, whether you're overworked or even underworked, things will conspire to suck the joy out of you. You will lose your passion. In fact, there, life is, is a season after seasonal thing. There's not a, a straight line. We have seasons. There, everything's going good, and then there's a season for everything, and there's a rhythm of life, and we need to, to have both rest and work. We need to have output and input. Too much work can cause you to lose your passion. But let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm just going to go meddling. Too much nothing can also suck the passion out of you. I've seen them. You've seen them, too. I'm not just bashing younglings who are always sitting there seven hours in the basement playing whatever, do that. Man, I don't think I'm bored. I don't have nothing to do. Well, good grief. You know, come out of the cave. <laughs> You're a vampire. You're paler than I am. How's that possible? <laughs> too much, too little. Remember, things are working against you to dissipate your zeal for the Lord. There are some people who probably need to work more. <laughs> Don't point. <laughs> A lot of us need to work less. You know, all of us, we have, we have different personalities. We have different things, and, and we can go to different extremes. But I want you to look at what Psalm 127 says. It says, it is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, fearing that you're going to starve to death. For God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. Did you know sleep is a gift from God? It tells us that in the scripture. This is a great verse, by the way, for your bathroom mirror or maybe your refrigerator. God wants you to have balance, to get your proper rest, to live a balanced life. For some of you, the problem is you are always giving out. You are always serving you are always helping, you're always sharing, you're always working, you're always trying to be generous, but you never take the time to recharge. This goes for a lot of us. Pastors, I can't tell you how many pastors I am counseling right now that don't know how to say no, that are working seven days a week. They're on call 24 hours a day, and their families are falling apart. And their marriage is a sham. They live an out-of-balance life. That is not from God. That is not what God intends for. If you never take to the time to recharge, you're going to have an, an imbalance. Do you know that imbalance can actually lead to a technical term called compassion fatigue? If you work in the medical field or maybe you care for a loved one, you know what this is. Compassion fatigue, if you haven't heard of it, it it's where you can care so much for so long that you eventually kind of grow numb to caring. Does that make sense? You grow so, you kind of grow numb. You're not being mean. You're not intentionally feeling this way. It's just you're kind of fried. You're numb. You're, you're depleted. And frankly, you can grow numb to caring about much of anything, even God. Like, Pastor, I'm not trying to be a less spiritual anything. I just, I just, like, I can't feel anything. I'm just kind of done. I'm numb. I don't really care about much of anything. You know why? Because, Mary, can you help me with this? Here, stand here next to me with this bowl. Imagine this bottle is you. You've got this. And you pour, the natural rhythm of life. You pour, and you try to take some back in. And you pour. Take a sip here. And you pour some more. And you give. And you serve. You're serving the kid, man. <laughs> You're on the signs and banner ministry, and it's raining Saturday night. You've got to set out the signs. God bless you. And you give, and you teach a class, or you go and you, you sit with that person who's been trapped at home with a loved one for years. You try to give them just a, an hour break of sanity. And you're giving, and you're pouring, and you keep pouring, and you keep pouring, and you keep, oh my goodness. You know what happens? You're depleted. And you can't pour from an empty cup. You can't. And God never intended you to. You've got to fill it up. You can't. I'm not even going to try to fill it. Hey, thank you, baby. Good. You can't pour from an empty cup. Eventually, you must refill at some point, or you will have nothing more to give. And looking at a crowd this size, I guarantee you, some of you can identify with that right there. But thankfully, God's word gives you the antidote for imbalance. First Timothy 4 says this. Take time. Okay, that means that there's your keep again. Take time. Take the trouble to keep yourself spiritually fit. Bodily fitness is great. It has a certain value. But spiritual fitness is essential both for this present life and for the life to come. 
He's saying, keep your spiritual fervor, right? You must maintain it. How do you do it? One word, balance. We all know being physically fit. That helps. That's great. A balanced diet. We got to have it. But spiritually fit, you got to have a balance of your spiritual disciplines. How are you doing with that? Protecting your time of worship corporately. Is this the highest priority for your family? If not, your kids will know. It'll show. Your coworkers will know on Monday whether you're a person who's been with Jesus or you're depleted. It's the highlight of my week. I fight for this front row. Can I just say something, by the way? I sat on the back one time. It is unbelievable, the difference in distractions. You cannot focus. When you're back there, you say, how many people go in the bathroom and doing this? And do, how, how, do, 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 do. When I'm on here, I don't see none of that. So it's okay to be a little selfish here. You want to fight for the front rows to come up? It changes your whole worship. The sound, the wave. I mean, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. Just throw, I protect this time of worship corporately. How about your private time of worship? Do you protect it? Do you keep your spiritual fervor? Or does anything and everything come between you and that? Oh, I got, I got to catch it. a little verse on the go. God, I'm busy. You know what I mean? I got my granola bar. I'm going to hit a, a little verse on the way, maybe while I'm driving. Do you protect your time of fellowship with other believers? Your small groups? That time to plug in. The bigger we go, the smaller we have to grow our roots. We have to plug into that. What about your private time of reading God's word? What about serving? Do you protect those spiritual disciplines of ministry so we're not only taking in and getting fat, and brr, 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 but we actually can give out? See, when we're out of balance, if you're focused only on one, if I just focus on fellowship and nothing else, well, hey, 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 <laughs> right? I'm going to be like a bloated tick. That's, that's gross, I know, but I want you to remember these. If nothing else, you're going to remember that image, right? If all I do is eat, I'm a fat little baby, like Amy Grant used to sing in 1982, right? And, and I just, that's, not, that's not healthy. I need to take what I've learned. I've got to serve, and I've got to go minister to others. I've got to do something with it. If you're out of balance, you will inevitably lose your passion. Number two reason I want to highlight today is unresolved conflict. <sighs> I wish I could skip this one. Can I just be honest? Conflict just drains the passion right out of you. You know what I'm talking about? I'm going to do a whole series on, on poison fruit coming up after Easter. And it's going to talk about how to deal with toxic people in your life who drain the life out of you. And toxic emotions, bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, resentment, all that. We're going to go, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. So you come and you enjoy that. You ever start your day and it's going awesome? Like you, you had time with God. It was great. You, you're, you know, you head out the door and, and like you're singing zippity doo da again. You're having a little bird sit on your shoulder, sings you a song from Disney. And I mean, everything is going great. Everything, you've showered, you put your right shoes on and you're having an awesome time. You're making out the door and then somebody texts you something and just, Ooh. What? And I mean, you were singing zippity doo da. All of a sudden the zip has left your doo da. You got nothing left. And you're just like that, what happened? Oh, well, now you've got unresolved conflict, and your passion just suddenly goes flat. Some of you may be in this situation right now, maybe at home or work, where you've got constant unresolved conflict. Obviously, you cannot control how others treat you, but you do get to control how you respond. This is where spiritual maturity comes in, church. You ready for this? All right? I'm just being real. I'm your friendly neighborhood pastor, right? Don't shoot me. Don't shoot daggers with your eyes. Some of you, I know you don't like this, but Job 5.2 puts it like this. Resentment kills a fool. And envy slays the simple. Y'all, these are some dangerous emotions that will suck the passion. Resentment, envy, jealousy, prolonged anger. If you're a note taker, and you, you may want to circle those words. Those are passion-killing words. Resentment, envy. Later, in Job 18, he goes even further and he says, you're only hurting yourself with your anger. When you're bitter and you're angry, it only, anger only hurts the angry one. You know that, right? The other person, they don't care. Right, here's the naked truth. Again, I'm just going to show it. When it comes to resentment and jealousy and prolonged anger, you're the only one who can make that decision to let that go. I want you to think about this. This is why forgiveness is so important. God knows us. He made us. He created us. And he knows we can't carry resentment. So he says, I want you to let it go. You think, well, Pastor, I've got it. I don't have anything. I don't deal with that. That's not a problem. Okay. All right. Let's go. Let's go real. Some of you on social media, you're smiling now. You know where this is going. Maybe somebody's unfriended you. You didn't know it. 
And I hadn't seen so-and-so in a while. And you go and you check it. It says, add friend. Well, when did that happen? I thought we were friends. Hmm, that's interesting. I think I'm going to go to their wall and I'm going to start cyber stalking. Right? You go and you check it out. You don't go there with the idea of, you know, checking and say, how you doing? I just went, right? And, and if you're not sure, here's a dead giveaway. If you're still bitter and you still are harboring resentment and you find yourself cyber stalking someone on social media, right? This is some of us right here. This, this is how we look. <laughs> just going to be honest. This is what some of us, can we zoom in on that and really, there we go. I just want you to see, this is how some of us look and we do it. We act like we don't. Shaq ain't the only one doing this. If, you, if this hits kind of close to home, you probably have some resentment. You probably have some unresolved conflict. And I know what some of you are thinking, Pastor, there ain't no way I can let this go. I'm going to check one more time. I'm going to make sure they're as miserable as I am, <laughs> right? Oh, man, that's not what God wants for you. He wants better for you than that. You say, God, Pastor, how am I going to let them off the hook? I'm not asking you to let them off the hook. You know what, you know what God's saying? God's saying put them in his hands. Right? You let them off your hook, put them on God's. He can handle that. That's his problem. Vengeance is his. He'll take, he knows if you've been wronged. I'm not saying you excuse any behavior. That, believe me, all scores will be settled. God is absolutely a God of justice. You don't have to worry about that. Thankfully, you're not the judge of the universe, and neither am I. He has this covered. And he doesn't need a whole lot of help from us in this. When we look at the justice of God, you say, God, I can't handle this, but you know what? You can. And I want you, you pray this, I want you to help me forgive them as you have forgiven me. And I'm going to leave this in your hands today. And if I have to keep leaving it in your hands daily, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to surrender this emotion of resentment daily, if need be, until this is no longer the chain around me. Are you with me? Does this make sense? You surrender. If you have this, this, this unresolved conflict, I promise you, it is going to suck the life out of you. It is going to control you, and that is not how God wants you to live. This is why you forgive. This is how you resolve that conflict in your heart. You give it to the Lord. You let him be the controlling factor. The third cause for loss of passion in your lives. And this was a doozy. You thought the last one was bad. Woo, here we go. An unconfessed sin. Oh, my goodness. Pastor, should have let us go at 11 like you said. Guys, this is a big one. I think there's probably a few things that rob you of joy and peace and confidence in life and passion than unrepented guilt, shame, all those awful feelings. This is how it is with guilt and sin in our life. See, most of the time, humans, we're not, we're not ignorant. You know, we don't run around flaunting our sin. Oh, I have massive unrepentant sin. I'm such a guilty person. We don't do that. You know what we do? We rationalize it. We say, it's not that bad. I mean, everybody's done a little bit. I mean, come on. Hey, we're all little sinners, right? I mean, we, we all have that. Yes, that is, this is a tool of the, of the devil. We cannot come and rationalize sin and just hope guilt goes away. That's not how it works. Sin is a real thing. God does not minimize sin. If you read the lyrics of the opening song today, sin is what caused Jesus' flesh to be brutalized. That's how serious it is. We can't wink at it and flirt with it under the table and act like it's no big deal because that's not true. But God gave us a remedy. You know there's multiple stages of sin? You want to show how we, we, we rationalize it? Let me, let me show you here. Here, here. Here's the first part, four stages of sin. Oh, we can, this looks interesting. <laughs> just going to dabble with the sin a little bit, right? I'm just stepping on the pool cover. And it really can't be that bad. And we think maybe for a minute, you know, we could get away with it. Maybe for a minute, it's really not, nobody's going to know. Really, it's not that big a deal. Only if it stayed there. But that dog didn't stay there. You know what happens next? Oh, this is worse than anticipated. Help me, Jesus, right? I want you to look at the size of those eyeballs. <laughs> Think about that, right? Hear me. Sin takes you farther than you want to go, and it always costs more than you think it will. Always. That's the nature of sin. That's what Satan wants. He wants you to feel it. He wants you to be attracted. Now, some of you are going, okay, Pastor, you're reading my mind. It's getting a little uncomfortable here. Relax. It's okay if the Holy Spirit convicts you. You know, sometimes 
it's good to be uncomfortable. It's okay. That means you're open. That means you're alive. <laughs> it means the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart saying, hey, there's all these rooms that you've given me, but I want that room. I want access to that one that you've kind of been, <laughs> my precious, right? I want access to that room. That's the unconfessed sin that's robbing you of joy. See, we can't feel enthusiasm and guilt at the same time. It doesn't work that way. You know that. You can't feel guilt and passion at the same time. You know why? Because guilt, by its very nature, robs you of passion. Psalm 34 does an incredible job in graphic detail describing how guilt makes us feel. It says this, my guilt overwhelms me. By the way, this is edited. I want you to go read this. This is your homework assignment. Read this whole chapter. This is edited. My guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. I am bent over and racked with pain. All day long I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me and my health is broken. Are you feeling the anguish? I'm exhausted. I'm completely crushed. And my groans come from an anguished heart. Hear me. You're not meant to live with this kind of guilt and this kind of shame. Thankfully, there is a remedy. There is a way to have a restoration of passion and freedom from guilt. It is God's good gift, and it is the good news. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite our musicians to come back up, and I want to share with you a, a really good closing story about our Potter's Hand Preschool. Years ago, you might remember, my little Mercy Hope started at Potter's Hand Preschool. And you're only supposed to be there, I think, like two or three years, something like that. Right, she was on the five-year plan. Mm -hmm. She loved it so much, she didn't want to leave. And as she got older, she went into a class, uh, the Owls, and the teacher there was Miss Stacy. Love her. Fantastic. She had the most incredible saying. I remember it to this day. This is years ago. And any time a kid was getting kind of out of control, or maybe they were making a bad choice and, and they were getting a little loud, rambunctious, she would come and kneel down in front of them and stare them in the face and say, good news, Mercy. You have a chance to make a better decision. <laughs> I was like, there's no way that's, and I watched it happen. It was like magic. I don't know how she did, but she, she got in there, they were doing something. Right, it's, it's great to stand on tables and play with knives, right? Oh, good news, Mercy. I'm going to give you a chance to make a better decision right now. How's that sound? Okay, yeah, sounds good. I'd like to make a better decision, right? It was this beautiful thing, and it worked. We still use it. Guys, guess what? It's like God is saying to us, good news, church. Good news. You don't have to handle your guilt and shame. I will. Good news, church. I'm going to make a better option for you. I'm going to take all your sin, all your guilt, all your shame. I'm going to put it on me. I'm going to take it on the cross, and you don't have to deal with that. Your shoulders weren't broad enough to carry it anyway. Good news, church. Jesus is risen. Good news, church. Your sin has been paid for. Do you see how this is the best news ever? When we look at this and we think, golly, God, you have given us the greatest deal. I love one of, his, one of his most famous verses that, that I quote. 1 John 1, 9 says this, says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. He can carry that. He can forgive our sins. He can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is why he came. This is the good news. And this verse right here is his promise. I love this verse. You know how many times I have fallen into the arms of this verse? It's his promise. Good news, church. You don't have to carry your sin. You can hand this off. Don't wait. I think some of us have carried around stuff like this for weeks, months, years. Starting to etch lines in our face. Our hearts are growing cold. You don't have to. Okay, you go through a rough season. All right, you fell off the horse. Get back up ride. We need you. The kingdom needs you. Did you stumble? Did you blow it? Okay, take a number. We all have. Get back up on the horse and ride. You're a forgiven child of God. You're a warrior. We need you. What's God saying to your heart today? In just a moment, we're going to stand. Maybe the altar is where you need to be and just say, God, I want you to reignite those fires. God, I have some unconfessed sin on it. Maybe you've got a family member who is just in chains. They've got conflict that's not resolved. Maybe you want to pray for them. Maybe there's a sin in their life. You want to pray, God, would you break that yoke? 
Break them. Let their heart be soft and supple. Would you do something that only you can do? Are you, that red warning light's flashing. God, I need you to do something about it. You don't have to carry it anymore. Very quietly, very reverently. Would you stand? We're going to sing this song. We're going to open the altar. And maybe you just want to come and say, God, I claim your promise today. I need you. Would you forgive me of sin? Would you restore that passion? God is here. His word is spoken. What's he saying to you? Just be obedient. The altar is open.